we start at what you might call the throat of the River Thames, a bit upstream from the mouth, with Nigel Rigby, Head of Research at the National Maritime Museum at Greenwich. We're standing on the banks of the River Thames, and it's a, it's a kind of an overcast day, and the, the tide's coming in, and maybe 100 years ago, 200 years ago, with the tide coming, you'd had a heck of a lot of ships just sailing up the river, up to the docks in London. It was a, a very busy port indeed. We've got prints and drawings and photographs from the late 19th century showing the river packed with shipping. It's a, a sort of maritime heritage. It's supposed to be sort of increasingly invisible to us today. Sea blindness, actually, the maritime industries call it. And my museum's quite bothered about it. But sea deafness, not hearing the sea, gets rather less attention. But if you listen, you'll hear the sea all around you. Just hundreds, if not thousands, of words and expressions in common use today had their origins at sea. Cock up. Taken aback. Show a leg. Now, that's a very good one. And if you stop to think about it, what has that got to do with the sea? Ah, now, chip on your shoulder is a very interesting one. And Nigel Rigby's idea of sea deafness and unawareness of the sound of the sea, including sea-related words and phrases, is an interesting one as well. A newly invented metaphor. In fact, you'd be taken aback by how many metaphors are washed ashore on the coastline of meaning by the movement of the sea. Nigel Rigby of the Maritime Museum again. When we say, I am taken aback, or someone was taken aback, we mean I was surprised. And that is an old expression from the sailing navy. It is when the wind goes in front of the sail rather than behind it, and so brings the, the ship to a grinding halt, unplanned. When you are taken aback, it means uh, it happens suddenly. Sudden shift in the wind, or the helmsman hasn't been paying attention, and it can have dire consequences. You can actually dismast the ship doing it that way. You didn't really want to happen. In other words, a potential cock-up. Here's another maritime historian, Michael Naxton. Cock-up? Well, I mean, I think everybody really knows what it means. Normally, the yards on a ship, and they're the, the spars that are at right angles to the masts from which the sails hang, they are always straight. It was sometimes done, if there'd been a death on board, to tilt the yards, and they were known when they were in that position as a cockbill. But if they were accidentally left slanting, this was regarded as untidy, sloppy, and generally wrong. And I think there's no doubt that this is where the expression, a cock-up, comes from. In the days of sail again, the sailors in the navy always deserted ship when ship was in harbour. So it became accepted practice that when a ship was in harbour, the men who were married could have their women on board to stay with them whilst the ship was tied up at the quayside. And when the boatswain came down in the morning to wake the sailors, the cry would go up, show a leg. And what it meant was that if the ladies hung one leg out of their hammock, it was obvious for the bosun to see that they were women and they were allowed to stay in bed for an extra half an hour. So the men got out immediately, but the people who had shown the leg were allowed to stay in bed a little bit longer. I always thought a cock-up was a printer's error, a sticking-up bit of misplaced type, but we don't want to give anyone a chip on their shoulder. Chip on your shoulder... It comes out of the naval dockyards, where you had a series of strikes through the, the 18th century over the right of the dockyard workers to take home logs of wood, chips, as they were called. They had to be a yard long, no more. There was a lot of dispute between the dockyard authorities and the dockyard workers over it, and there were strikes over it, and they forced the dockyard workers to carry these chips on the shoulders to make sure that they were right size and they were only bringing out the right amount so that's where the resentment comes in. Because the dockyard workers felt resentful at having to display what they considered to be their ancient rights, which is actually, if you go to Portsmouth to this day and you look in some of the old dockyard houses, you'll find their stairs are exactly a yard wide for that very reason. And a well-worn meteorological favourite, it's cold enough to freeze the balls off a brass monkey. But what was a brass monkey? Michael Maxton, then Nigel Rigby. Brass monkey... Uh, was a triangle of brass that used to sit on the ship's deck 
in which the cannonballs were placed. If you stop to think about it, cannonballs on a warship, perfectly round, you had to keep them in something or they'd go rolling all over the place. Therefore, they were stacked in a nice neat little pyramid. And it used to be thought uh, that this little brass triangle, which was known as the monkey, would, in the depths of winter, get so cold, the metal would contract and the cannonballs would fall off and roll all over the deck. No one in their right minds would put cannonballs on a grid that they could roll off on an open deck in anything like a chop, because a cannonball rolling around a deck could cause serious damage. You know, you could crush a foot or anything like that. So it just strikes me as an absurd derivation, because it just wouldn't ever have existed. Now, some experts say that actually a brass monkey was a small cannon known as a monkey and always made of brass. But the same principle applied. In very, very cold weather, in the depths of winter, the brass of the cannon contracted and the balls fell out. The cannonballs wouldn't fit properly, so they just fell out. Monkey is actually used in naval slang. It was a slang term for a a spike, really, that was used to lift or lower the gun. That was one expression for it. Uh, It was also a slang term for a penis as well. Uh, So you can actually see there might conceivably be some sort of link between, you know, penis and balls being pressed off. But again, that's not been proven and it's very hard to prove these things. Oh dear. It is not the intention of this programme to foment discord between naval historians, nor did we intend any below-the-plimsoll line references. The point is, many, many marine metrics have come ashore into our language, and it doesn't matter if we forget where exactly they embarked. It is the case, though, that charting a course towards an understanding of metaphor of the navel-gazing kind or otherwise will not be plain sailing. Plain sailing goes back to, again, about the 17th or 18th century, after something called the Mercator projection was brought in for charts, for maritime charts. Yes, Um, thank you. Thank you, Mr Rigby, but another explanation won't be necessary, and apologies for the interruption, but having established that derivation isn't necessarily a friend to the understanding of metaphor, let us instead travel to an intensely metaphorical place of work, a place where metaphor is central to the very meaning of the enterprise. A poet's pad? A linguist's lair? A lexicographer's loft on Lexington Avenue? No. No, this is in fact the North London shopfront of Eurosea, where in addition to running a Greek language travel agency, Dora Constantinou oversees an international business dealing in removal, which in Greek is... Metaphores. Yes, we transfer, transport. We are dealing uh, with metaphors to different countries, for instance, yes. When you talk to people, what is your occupation? We say for removers, ya fores, we say. You say metaphoric when you say to somebody, for instance, life is not a bed of roses, yes, that's a metaphor, yes? Yes, I suppose it transfers, it carries, it carries from one thing to the other. You carry the meaning, it's like a truck, but you carry the item from one place to the other. So you can say, I suppose, it does mean transport, transferred, metaphora, metaphorico. Yes, it has got the same kind of meaning. Metaphores. Yes, we transfer, transport. A transport, in Mrs. Constantinou's case, of delight. Dr. Guy Deutscher is an Israeli linguist from the University of Leiden in the Netherlands and author of The Unfolding of Language, a pleasingly metaphorical title. In Greece, you can do metaphors between your bank accounts. It simply means you transfer money from one place to another. And removal vans, as you've seen in Greece, are called metaphors because they transfer your furniture. But when we use the word metaphor, we're not talking about transfer of furniture, we're talking about transfer of meaning. We take a concept and transfer it from its original environment to a completely different domain of meaning. Metaphors, certainly of everyday language, almost always move from the concrete. Almost always you take a concept from the physical world and you use it to express things that are more abstract or at least more complex.
and we must go to the year 1912 for an illustration, a famous tragedy, a maritime one as it happens. World's largest metaphor hits iceberg. Titanic, representation of man's hubris, sinks in North Atlantic. 1,500 dead in symbolic tragedy. New York, April 15. Officials of the White Star Line have confirmed the sinking during her maiden voyage of the RMS Titanic, the world's largest symbol of man's mortality and vulnerability. This is from the somewhat unreliable American publication, The Telegraph Office of the White Star Line, which owns the archetype. At 4.23 a.m. Greenwich Time, the following message was received from the rescue ship Carpathia. Titanic struck by icy representation of nature's supremacy. Stop. Insufficient lifeboats due to pompous certainty in man's infallibility. Stop. Microcosm of larger society. Stop. It is believed at this time that upwards of 1,500 passengers aboard the metaphor may have perished in the imperturbable liquid immensity that, irrespective of mankind's congratulatory progress, blankets most of the globe in its awful dark silence. The Titanic story, according to The Onion, graphically illustrating as part of its spoof history, Our Dumb Century, the journey from the specific to the abstract. The Titanic leaves our shores as a concrete, or rather steel, entity, only to meet an icy destiny which eventually became almost entirely metaphorical. Guy Deutscher again. Yes, I think it is a good example, taking a very concrete concept, like a ship, and using it for describing various processes that take place in much more abstract worlds. Titans are, the, are these giants to start with, so the name Titanic is already metaphoric, and when we use it now as a metaphor for something else, it's a second-level metaphor, if you want, for something even more abstract. I think it's quite often used also as a metaphor for hubris, things that go wrong because we're just too proud. But metaphors come in all sizes, from the giant to the barely noticeable, from the freshly coined, and coining is a minty metaphor, to the dried and desiccated, which is a coconut-flavoured one. Take this sentence. To discover metaphors in everyday language is a thrill that drives me balmy with joy. I'm not being sarcastic. Chock full of metaphors, though, as Guy Deutscher points out, long-buried ones. Exactly. It's all full of what I call skeletons of dead metaphors. They were once lively metaphors, but they've been dead for such a long time that their original sense has been forgotten ages ago. Practically every single word in the sentence is such a sentence. So discover, well actually that's not quite as the rest, but that literally just... That literally... That's a native English word. Discover is from Latin, of course. Balmy is also from Old English, and that originally just smelt full of balm. Balm is froth in the top of beer, whatever, or milk. And some... ...their original meanings gets you nowhere. To... In everyday language is piercing thing that makes me frothy with joy, and I am not tearing flesh when I say that. Means nothing. We might just as well stick with the skeletons. These are sort of skeletons that may be thousands of years old from different languages, especially from Greek and Latin in the case of English, that no one, unless they look at etymological dictionaries, would ever imagine are metaphors. But in fact, they're all skeletons of what were li once very lively metaphors. You have corpses of metaphors, you have skeletons of metaphors, you have metaphors which are still alive. But ordinary language is no less dense with metaphors than poetic language, I think, in fact, possibly even more so. So our language is a veritable Davy Jones locker of metaphor, metaphor upon metaphor. Come to think of it, language is a metaphor based on the word tonguing, and tongue itself, when used to mean language, i.e. a foreign tongue, is a metonym, a useful one-word metaphor, like the press, meaning people who work in journalism, or hitting the bottle, meaning alcohol once closely connected. 
Oh, and if you're knackered from keeping up with all this carting about of meaning, knackered meaning tired enough in a horsey way to be worthless and ready to be destroyed and rendered into dog food and or glue, take a minute to relax. Her dead and alive is so ubiquitous in English, could we do without it? Supposing the forbidden trio of deviation, repetition, and, uh, hesitation were joined in the game of just a minute by metaphor. Supposing in that game you had to call a spade a digging implement, would the judge's buzzer fade under the strain? Well, I think it would just beep all the time. If you say that you're not allowed to use skeletons or metaphors either, then you really can't say anything. And when you can just grunt, um, that would be the most you can say without using metaphors. And if metaphor had not been around, then we would never have progressed beyond grunts. <coughs> so, from the grossness of grunts to the pinnacles of poetry. Yes, Nicholas, you can stop that now. We've stopped playing. Thank you. Initially, it was held that poetic language was somehow simply language intensified by metaphor and formulated with the bells and whistles and the rhythmic drums of verse. And that may be true. Yet we've already seen how everyday language is already intense with metaphor, built on metaphor, cravenly dependent on metaphor to help us ease the passage between concrete and abstract ideas. Dr. Liz Barry, senior lecturer in English at the University of Warwick. Poetic metaphors differ from everyday metaphors because there's often an element of surprise. Even the sense that a rule's been broken or that a category error has been made. So it's not often immediately obvious without the context of the literary work how the metaphor is working, how we can talk about the subject of the poem in these terms. And some of the most conspicuous examples of this, of course, come from the metaphysical poets of the 17th century. So apparently outlandish or extravagant metaphors are used and can be the whole basis of the poem. And the most famous example, can two lovers be like a pair of compasses in Dunn's prediction forbidding morning? If they be two, they are two, so as stiff twin compasses are two. Thy soul, the fixed foot, makes no show to move, but doth if the other do. John Donne's lovers can be like compasses of the sort that draw circles or measure distances on maps in the way they're linked, even when paradoxically separated. And though it in the centre sit, yet when the other far doth roam, it leans and hearkens after it and grows erect as that comes home. Well spotted if you saw that the central compasses metaphor was a cartographical, possibly marine one, and stand by to abandon ship if formalism, modernism, and postmodernism brings on a little queasiness. Because according to modern theory, poetic language isn't just everyday language with knobs on. Dr. Liz Barry. The group of critics called the Russian formalists in the early 20th century, people like Viktor Shlovsky and Boris Eichenbaum and Roman Jakobson, argued for the distinct nature of poetic language argued that literature's job was to defamiliarise its subject matter, that poetry was performing a kind of estrangement on its reader, making them feel that the world was alien to them for poetic ends. And this is often talked about in terms of violence. So Jacobson calls poetry organised violence committed on ordinary speech. That, that poetry manipulates ordinary language to make us strange, to make us notice it and concentrate on it and remember it, and to make language in this way more powerful. A metaphor is a very central part of that. And in modernist writing, the writing that perhaps fits best with, with Shlovsky and Jacobson's theory, takes the concept of estrangement or defamiliarisation to new levels. You know, these writers are questioning fundamental categories such as time and space, in the light of Einstein's theory of relativity, you know, nature of human motivation um, after Freud, and the idea of the unconscious. And a poet like T.S. Eliot revives the practice of the metaphysical poets, using apparently outlandish metaphors in order to disorientate the reader and make them think in new ways. 
famously in his love song of Alfred J. Prufrock, Let us go then, you and I, when the evening is spread out against the sky, like a patient etherized upon a table. So bear that image of nature in terms of culture and not the other way round. Somehow expressing a moment, you know, this poem written in 1919, just after the First World War, where humanity's relationship with the world is complicated, is threatened by modern advances. There's a question being asked about human reason, human progress, and the world is sterile and passive, you know, etherized upon a table because of an over-reliance on reason and a lack of faith and spirituality for Eliot. So using these very disorientating metaphors to make us think about the moment and the way in which people were feeling about their world and, and human society at that particular point in time. Time is perhaps the hardest concept of all to understand and Perhaps that's why literature has been so absorbed by it, so exercised by it. It has tried so hard to give us ways of understanding it. But modernist writers post-Einstein are living in a world where the idea is even more complicated, that the categories of time and space have, to some extent, collapsed into one another. In a a writer like Samuel Beckett, there is an explosion of metaphors of time, new metaphors of time, time behaving in ways in in the subjective perceptions of of his characters that we've never seen it behave before. Time piles up, time thickens. Although it could be argued that making you think in a different way, even where time is concerned, is just what everyday metaphor does. And metaphor in everyday language gave us, according to some a kind of introduction to the space-time relationship long before Einstein. Guy Deutscher. Think about it this way. If I say that a long time has passed, in fact, I've used two metaphors, because time cannot literally be long or short. It's not a piece of string. We've used a description from space and have applied it to this abstract notion of time. And when I've said time has passed... That's also a metaphor, because what really passes is a train or ships at night, Uh, not time. Time doesn't literally go somewhere. So it's not just that we need metaphor from space to talk about time. We actually need it to think about time, because we have no other way of of conceptualizing it or visualizing it. We talk about the future being in front of us, but the future is not literally in front of us. The person is in front of us, just like the past is not literally behind us, because Literally, it's a shadow that's behind us. We can't say that language has discovered the concept of space-time exactly in in the sense that Einstein used it. That would be a bit much. But certainly, language has discovered the intimate relation between space and time thousands of years ago. No time to discuss metaphor and modernism, Einstein and Eliot. Let us go down to the sea again and join plain old HMS metaphor, where, we must remember, we were surveying the sea as a source and shaper of language. Here's maritime historian Michael Maxton with a geographical allusion. If you like, the ratio of population to coastline is colossal compared to most other countries, if not any other country. A huge number of Britain's inhabitants were one way or another connected to the sea. And if you have a nation that has absorbed cultural influences by sea from very many different cultures, then uh, it may well be that the range of metaphors, the range of cultural metaphors is much wider than in other languages. It may well be. This is just a guess, yes. And let's stay with that satisfying metaphor of a coastline and add a geolinguistic one that explains how language is shaped by being transported from the physical to the abstract. I talk about this flow of metaphors from concrete meanings to abstract senses. And in that flow, the metaphors are gradually eroded of their original force and sense and are deposited gradually and then layer after layer, language grows. What starts as large, pointy rocks, these are fresh images and fresh metaphors, are gradually ground down by use and overuse and end up as the sand that we all step on when we speak in everyday language. Πόσα πράγματα έχετε μέσα στο σπίτι, είναι three-bedroom house, 
Even Dora Constantinou, as she organizes another shipment of furniture from Greece to England, can instinctively see how long buried meanings can relate to everyday language. Yes, deep down, there might be a connection. Yes, deep down, there might be a connection with uh, metaphors, with transport. Yes.